Well, good evening, everybody. And happy Valentine's Day. What a treat. So great to have so many of you. It's like a family date night. How cool is this? Yeah, yeah, this is great. Uh, before we get started, before I introduce Canty, a couple of things, please. Let's get your phones on mute, airplane mode, turn them off, whatever, whatever it takes uh, so as to not interrupt the lecture. Uh, second, take all the pictures you want, but remember, don't use a flash, because if we blind Canty, she's not going to know which chocolates to hand out, and that's going to be bad. Uh, uh, we have a beautiful night tonight, so the observatory is open, open until 10 o'clock tonight, so after the lecture on your way out, it's a little nippy, but it's, it's great weather, the skies are clear. Uh, so take a moment to go the, into the observatory and of course, we have free planetarium shows uh, this evening, so there'll be a show, uh, one after, after the lecture. So, um, boy, I wish I could uh, take credit for this, uh, for this idea, but Canty's been talking about um, a, a, a lecture on chocolate for years. Uh, if you don't know her, Canty Smith is our director of education. She's been working with us for uh, almost uh, 14 years now, and under her purview, are all the educational programs, uh, the planetarium programs, uh, the, the great staff that she works with, uh, even the volunteer uh, uh, program, all under her. So in, the amp in her ample free time, she comes up with ideas like this, because she, she's just so creative, and she's so, so much fun to work with. Uh, you can see her, uh, she's also an artist, you can see her artwork in the mineral gallery. Uh, she loves rocks and minerals, very creative, always coming up with stuff, but like I said, she's just been dying to do this uh, uh, on chocolate for years, so what a, here we are, Valentine's Day. So uh, without the further ado, so as to not delay the distribution of chocolate I'd like to bring to the stage, please give a round of applause and welcome Canty Smith. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jose, and he is right. I am a fan, and if you're here tonight, then that means you must be a fan, a fan as well. Is that correct? Yes. yes, all right, all right. Well, so excited, and speaking of fans, mine's up here for my timepiece. Let me be sure to put that on silent there. And uh, excellent. And I wanna just dive right in. I'm gonna not, I, I'm probably not gonna speak as much to the history tonight as I am to the science. After all, we're a science museum, that's why we're here. And you have to know, you have to know, there is so much information out there. It was so difficult for me to glean what I thought would be appropriate because I know what we're gonna be young families. You know, that's kind of our demographic here. But I wanted to make it fun for those of us that are, you know, maybe a little bit older and just, you know. And so I hope that I've hit a happy medium in this. So thank you for bearing with me. Uh, Jason, I think we're ready to kind of kick right in here and where, there it is. Okay, so we're going to experience chocolate today and that's the goal. I have seven different components of chocolate for us to taste tonight. And we're going to talk about that one a little bit more. Uh, I do want you to, before I dive into everything, just think, I don't, does anybody here have any food allergies or any food concerns? Excellent. I said, I don't see a hand. Do I see a hand? Okay, well, first of all, chocolate is gluten-free, so if you have any concerns about that, the chocolate is one of, uh, it's called Theobromo, food of the gods in Latin, and it is very rich. It has over 300 different chemicals in it, uh, but it in itself has no gluten, but it could be that something, and I'm not sure why I'm making that noise, what am I hitting? Of something. Uh, so, uh, sorry, that so startled me. So Theobromo, Food of the Gods, oh, uh, additives. And so there could be something, if you're allergic to tapioca or rice, um, and certainly milk, when we get to the milk chocolate, if you'd like to come up and look at the back, and actually I have it in the, the screen, but if you wanna just double check the ingredients. I just wanted to make that. These uh, samples have all been prepared in a food safe environment. And um, so that was my opening uh, salvo into just the uh, component of your health and chocolate. So here we go. There are four different varieties of cocoa. And before we go any further, the difference between, how many of y'all heard cacao and then have heard cocoa and have wondered what's the difference? 
Anybody else out there? Excellent. Well, if we're talking about cacao, you're actually talking about the tree and the pod itself. And that's my hair. I don't know that there's much I can do about that. Y'all excuse me here. So here is, I actually have a pod. And um, I know you get out there and you hear different things. Oh, ch chocolate's a vegetable. No, 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 chocolate's a fruit. And it goes back and forth, back and forth. But I think that I'm fairly, uh, from the research that I have read, chocolate is considered a fruit if you consider it coming from this particular uh, organic module here. Because this is a pod and inside of it, you're going to find different seeds. And so we're gonna talk some more about that. But right now, back to the four different types of beans, uh, there is forastero, which is a very common bean. It's very robust and tends to grow in a variety of different places. We have carrillo, which is a very um, high-end and very rare and delicate bean that has a lot of nuanced flavors. We have um, uh, trentantaro, which is actually a combination of the two. And then we have um, another one called National, which is very popular in French and Italian chocolates, if y'all are into that. So, uh, but those are the four basic kinds. A lot of different chocolates are singular in the bean that they use. And then a lot of them do different types of blends. And that's why you see so many different kinds of chocolates out there. One of the things we know is that the cacao tree is considered an understory tree. At its maximum height, it's usually only 14 feet high. And it's kind of interesting because it thrives in heat, which that's good, but it also has to have shade. So how do you thrive in heat, but also you have to have shade? You plant another tree beside it that's gonna be taller and it's gonna give it shade. And that tree usually is a banana tree. So there you have it, you can see uh, on the, um, and I'm at an odd angle here, uh, sorry. So 20 degrees on the equator is what we're looking at here. And this is where the cacao tree grows in this area. And you can see that very narrow band of yellow. Who do you think consumes most of the chocolate in the world? Exactly, they are not, we are not in that yellow band, are we? So it's very intriguing that where it's grown is not necessarily where it's really consumed. So, as I was saying, here's our chocolate pod, and we have um, the cacao pod. They actually, um, botanically, uh, they will just slice this out in the field, and they'll strip out the seeds, which you see uh, the ladies doing here as they're cleaning the pod. And you can see when they harvest it, they have to be really careful because these grow very tightly together and they grow right from the tree trunk, from the heavy stems. And so if they don't cut it just right, they can literally damage the tree and um, really inhibit the harvest. And of course, this is what they make their living on. This is, their, this is where they, uh, and this is one of the things about fair trade that's so important when you consume your, your chocolate. Be aware of just, um, you know, we want to be sure that we're, we're um, treating everybody in a fair and reasonable manner when we consume things. So fair trade is really important, and especially so for cocoa. So we have our cacao pod, a cacao tree, and then from here on out, most of the things I'm going to talk about tonight, I'm going to use the word cocoa, and just know that sometimes you can use them interchangeably, but botanically speaking, we have discussed our cacao at this point. So... So here's another photograph of the cacao pod, and you can see those um, beads and uh, the beans that are there. And the very, uh, after the growth and the harvest, the first and second step, then we go to fermentation. And this is when they're gonna strip all of those um, beans out and they're covered with this fruity um, flesh. The seed is inside, you see the white part there, that's the fruity flesh of it. And what they do is there's, um, there's like a membrane over the bean. They peel the membrane away. They pop the beans off of the stem that runs through the middle. And then they are going to combine it and they're going to put it in vats. Fermentation is a very intriguing chemical, organic chemical experience where we have amazing foods. How many things do we eat that are fermented? Think about it. Shout out a few. It's okay. We're 
Beer. <laughs> Beer. Sauerkraut. Sauerkraut, kimchi. Uh, we've got uh, bread requires fermentation, right? Wines certainly do as well. So think about all the foods that we eat that require fermentation to make it occur. And chocolate is right there with everything else. Not only can, uh, can chocolate, can the uh, bean be fermented once, but it can actually be fermented multiple times. And that's part of somebody's secret recipe. That's part of their, uh, part of their process. So it's very intriguing. So we have fermentation and you can see in Africa especially, if they're out in the field, and this is not uncommon if you're, in, if you're making a small artisanal chocolate and you're doing something. We have people in the United States, you know, I promise you, if you go online, it is stunning how many people make their own chocolate. And it's amazing that this is one of the ways that you can do it. So you can see the gentleman's taken banana leaves and laid that down. Of course, those are readily available because that's the upper story tree that's shading the cacao tree. Then he has logs on top of that. And the stem of the leaf itself is actually going into this milk jug here. And as the beans, they put the beans on top, they cover it with some more banana leaves and the fermentation process begins. Now here, they're actually waiting for the wild yeast to come in and mix with the sugar of the fruit. And the fruit is called baba. Uh, but if we're actually making it ourselves, if we're in the kitchen, we might be using some apple cider vinegar that has the mother, it has that yeast in it. As a matter of fact, when you taste the uh, nib tonight, well, I don't wanna to go too far in, but you might notice a certain subtle fragrance, and then I'll let you tell me whether or not you tasted it or not before I go too far. So you can see how even out in the field, the fermentation process, the beginning of chocolate is very important and it begins. The next process in this is the drying and the, and the shipping. And so you can see, uh, obviously we have a very nice warehouse, very technologically savvy in this. And so you, uh, then they have different vats where they're mobile and they can roll them in and roll the other one back out to just be dried by the sun. That's how they do it. They're raking, they're um, piling them back up on top of each other to allow them to ferment. Fermentation takes a minimum of three days. And again, depending on the bean itself, it might vary. Also, depending on the weather. If it happens to rain or shower, they actually get banana leaves and cover it back up so the beans don't get wet again. So it's a very interesting process and pretty complicated when you think about it. they're doing all this out there. So after the drying, the next thing that has to come about is the shipping. And so we're gonna look at, and if you'll take a look at your notes right there, I know it's teeny tiny type on this, but it was the best flow chart I could find that had all the steps in how chocolate is processed. And if you'll notice, it starts up here from the plantation, it goes down the page, makes a circle and starts to come back up. So that's how you read it in this format. It's kind of, it's different from some things. So you're gonna follow the arrow. So we're here and we're looking at, oh, and by the way, I wanna give credit. This is from um, Valrona Chocolates who created this map. Uh, they make chocolates in France and they are very well known for their chocolate schools. And so um, that's just one of the side notes, a little sidebar for that, but I did wanna give them credit for that. And if you'll notice on the right side, and I do apologize for this, this is totally on me. I decided to save a tree when I saw I made an error. If you'll look on this right side of your page, you'll see the bottom starts with a nib. That's the first thing we're gonna taste. The second one is the cocoa powder. Third is the cocoa butter. And then my screen has four, five, six, seven. And for some reason that did not transfer to your, your script there. Do you have something different? Yeah, so if you'll take your pencil and just for, um, I think it's the uh, white chocolate that might have gotten out of order, but we're actually gonna be tasting seven different things. And uh, so just wanted to show you that, make that correction there and we'll all be together on the same page. So the next part of making cocoa is grinding the, the nib itself. Now, this can take place two ways. Uh, usually, it's ground initially, and do you see where it's the husk of the bean is coming off the top here? That paper-like husk. Remember, uh, I'm sure when we eat peanuts, like we're here at the ball game, and you have that husky paper-like shell that's over it, that's called a husk, and that has to be removed 
from the um, chocolate, just like you usually, eh, sometimes some people like the peanut husk and some people don't. But it does need to be removed here because if you leave it in, it makes it bitter. The chocolate can be bitter. And so it's put through this machine and it's winnowed. And it's a very interesting process. If you're out in the field, you literally have a basket, you're shaking the beans, you toss them up in the air and the wind blows the husk off as the seed falls back into your basket. And so this is a process that they do out in the field and this is a machine. And again, back to engineering, it's amazing how many people are constantly coming up with different types of machines for the kitchen just for chocolate, just for making chocolate. So we've got this different um, winnowing machine and then it is going to prepare and grind and make our cocoa mass. And that is, um, so, but before we get to that, the first thing we're going to taste, and I want to introduce our servers tonight. We've got Vicki here. Hey, Vicki, one of our educators. We've got Brandy in the back. We've got, who do we have? I can't see. Sarah is at the back door, who is our uh, volunteer manager. How many volunteers do I have here tonight? Wonderful, thank you so much. I'm just looking to see. So if you're interested in volunteering, please see Sarah. She would be more than happy to chat with you. And then we have Brooklyn back in the back who gets extra kudos because she worked very hard with me and with Jean Schuster who's not here tonight as we prepared and put all these little samples together. And then I've got Jack over here in the corner. So a round of applause for your servers tonight. So at this time, I'm gonna ask Excuse me? Where's Gretchen? I'm so sorry, Gretchen. Thank you very much, Jack. And Gretchen's back here too. Let's do another round of applause just because it feels good. My apologies. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. All right, so at this time, I'm going to ask the servers. They're going to come to your table. Y'all can go ahead and start moving, but if you will listen to me for directions. Your servers are going to bring the tin to your table. Every table has its own tin, and in the tin has its own cup that has nibs in it. Nibs are a cocoa bean that has been ground. If you've not had them before, they can be bitter, but they are very powerfully chocolatey, okay? So go ahead and take a, cup, a little paper cup out, being a little cautious, because they might spill out, but go right ahead. If you make a mess, it's fine. It'll be here till we clean it up later tonight. And go ahead and, go ahead and start tasting. You'll notice you have your little spoon there. You can use your spoon if you're very dainty. <laughs> I see these, these, uh, a lot of people enjoy putting their nibs in their granola. They top their ice cream with it. They can put, you can put it in a variety of different shakes. It's a very healthy and rich, nutrient rich, item has a lot of magnesium and we're going to talk some more about the chemistry of chocolate in just a minute all right does who does not have their chocolate nibs yet everybody got your chocolate nibs wonderful all right everybody enjoy turn to your neighbor all right Excellent. All right, I'm going to ask that their side conversations would end right now. I am curious if anyone else tasted some of the ladies and gentlemen. I'm looking for everybody. All eyes back up here. Thank you. So did anyone else notice the flavor that I picked up on with this particular brand of nibs? Oh, and that's something else. Different brands taste different. It just depends. Where have they been harvested? What terrar, who knows what a terrar is? That's a big word. Uh, if, the impact of the soil on I'm so sorry, I didn't. The impact of the soil on exactly so. And it, we hear about terrar a lot if we're talking about wine, if we're talking about coffee beans, but it's very important for coffee as well. Where is it grown? Uh, you know, how is it packaged? Does it have anything else in it besides just the nib? Uh, and some, as I mentioned, uh, who, I want to go back to flavor. Did anybody pick up on anything? What did you taste when you ate the nib? Orange. Somebody said beer? Bitter. Bitter. Orange. Orange. 
What else? There's no wrong answer here. I mean, it's just this is all subjective. Almond. Almond. Almost sweet, but yeah. Kind of alcoholic, kind of a little astringent, maybe. Spike. Coffee, good. Medicine. Oh, that's interesting because there are some medicines that have that type of chocolate flavor in it. Very interesting. Well, you're not wrong. I mean, obviously, it's a subjective question. Uh, I know when I tasted it, I felt like I tasted a little bit of the vinegar myself. Uh, and then this process, in the fermentation process, uh, one of the things that they do as they collect it in that jug, it actually makes a cocoa wine. But it's very, a very, um, you know, it's not the kind of thing that's marketed. It's not marketed because obviously it's a very small amount, but apparently it's very tasty. And so someone who mentioned alcohol, you're spot on with that as well, because there could be, even though it's not alcoholic by any way, shape, or form, you might have caught some aroma for that. All right, so that was our cocoa nib. Now the next part of this is we're gonna look at the chocolate liqueur. And this is the first process uh, after the nib has been ground, and it's gonna look a lot like this. This is called a chocolate liqueur or a chocolate paste, and the thick paste is actually made of totally of the cocoa solids and the cocoa butter. It's all still bound together. And uh, it does not contain alcohol at this point, though. I wanna stress that. Even though you might have caught an aroma of that, there is no alcohol in the nib or in what you're, anything else that you're getting ready to eat tonight. So. Um, we are going to be ready to watch a video, and do I start it up here, Jason? No, I went to the wrong one. The child will not stop insisting this on tasting this. I keep telling him it's going to be gross, but he does not want to listen. So I'm going to let him find out for himself. <laughs> round of applause for the little guy, huh? Now, I got to say, this is your, uh, this is kind of a warning on this. I need everybody's attention back because I honestly remember doing that. Is there anybody else in here that has done that before? <laughs> See, look at this. A lot of us have. You have a very small spoon. Uh, I would like for the, um, Cocoa, the cacao powder at this point to come to the table at this time and go ahead and distribute that. Uh, it is very potent, very powerful, it's very concentrated. Take your spoon and just get a little tiny taste. I do not want to see a repeat of the, the Puff the Magic da Dragon with the cocoa powder coming out, okay? Just a little tiny taste. But here's the second part of your direction. Hang on to it because we're going to do something different with it in just a minute. So just take a tiny taste and then set it aside. All right, let's taste our cocoa powder. All right, I know everybody had a chance to taste it. As soon as our servers have retrieved those tins, I'd like for you to go ahead and I want you to um, put out our cocoa butter. And while they're distributing that, 
I just want to share with you a little bit about how cocoa butter or cacao butter is exactly what we're consuming tonight. The reason it's called, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. The reason it's called cacao is at this point, what you are eating has not been heated. It's not been tempered. And that's why it's still called cacao. It's, it is clean. It has been, uh, technically it's not pasteurized, but it is clean. So the cocoa butter itself is coming to the table. We use cocoa butter in a variety of different ways. We eat it, obviously, we mix it into our chocolate. You can use it for cooking. It's a, it's a very good, uh, it's a very good um, carrier cream for any essential oils. And so what I want you to do before you eat it is I want you to take your spoon and maybe just get a little bit and just want you to rub it on the back of your hand and see what that feels like. A little bit of that cocoa on the back of your hand because we use it in a variety of different creams and lotions. Now I want you to smell it. Does it have an aroma? Mm-hmm. Great. Now, remember I asked you to hold on to your cocoa powder. I want you to take your spoon, get a little bit of your cocoa butter, and I want you to dip it into the cocoa powder this time and see what happens. Just, just observe what happens. So what have you observed? What do you see? What's happened as you put the powder into the cocoa? What's your, practice your observation skills. It gets smooth. So obviously the, the powder is absorbed into the cream. Has anybody tasted it yet? Yeah? yeah? What would you think about the taste this time? It takes the bitter away. Fats will do that. It's just like, in, and I know we actually considered, you know, a way for you to cleanse your palate with this. Just didn't have enough time or space. But it is, a cocoa butter is gonna coat everything with that fat. Another remarkable thing about cocoa butter is that it stays solid at room temperature, but what happened as soon as you put it on your skin or as soon as you ate it? It melted, it melted. So it has a very unique chemical structure that allows it to melt as soon as it warms up to our body temperature. Isn't that cool? Okay. So we're looking at the fact, we know that cocoa butter is used for cooking. We can use it in a variety of different health products. And I'm so sorry. And so here's what we just consumed in our cocoa butter. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Here's our, um, if I could get everybody's attention back to look at these pictures, they're kind of interesting. And I, and I am still, I'm missing a video, Jason. I don't know where it went. Maybe it'll show up later. So uh, the next process in chocolate is called conching. And it was called that because the first um, individual who created a machine to make it, actually, uh, the, the machine itself actually looked like a conch shell. So that's why they call it conking. So, uh, But it's a very careful process. And if you'll notice, the, um, the, this is one of the very early conking. And look at that, it's nothing but granite. It's a granite roll on a granite slab. And you push it back and forth and it grinds your nibs and the, it grinds it into, at some point it begins to separate out. You have a separation of the cocoa butter uh, and then it leaves another cake of the cocoa. So we just ate the cocoa butter and then the cake itself is what the powder is, it's been solid and then it's been ground into the powder that you ate tonight and so that's the process that it goes through to make these two different products so pretty cool 
So the next part in our chocolate making is the tempering and the molding that's required. Tempering, and if you'll notice, I have a, there's a thermometer in the bowl there. Uh, and so it's something that uh, it really varies. And it can't, again, it depends on the recipe as to the amount of temperature that it takes. And you can temper your chocolate many different kind, times. As a matter of fact, uh, as you temper it, the grains actually tend to get tinier and tinier and tinier. And so frequently, the more expensive chocolates, because it's taken more time to be tempered, to be heated and cooled, heated and cooled, heated and cooled, become more expensive because it takes more time to make them. The more delicate in flavor and in the texture itself. So we have this, um, this particular uh, tempering and then of course the molding itself as you can put uh, chocolate has that wonderful ability to take on the form of something that you put it into and so that's a really cool item on that as well so i have kind of an interesting demonstration here this is uh, you know we were talking about temperature so i want to talk a little science very briefly here Chocolate is something that's called a polymorph. Polymorph. Poly means many, right? And morph means it changes, something's changed. So it has many changes. So we know that chocolate actually has six different forms of chocolate crystals, depending on where the temperatures are. So without getting too elaborate, I did go ahead and do the conversions for us there, as you see, with our centigrade to Fahrenheit, so that we're a little bit more familiar. And you can see it's really not a huge range in the temperature, but those initial, uh, the lower uh, the, um, the first crystal in, in the fat, in the cocoa butter, is, forms at 63.14 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's a cooler temperature and that's when it forms. Well, if you've got a pot of chocolate, it's gonna cool gradually anyway, right? So it's gonna kinda cool from the top down. But I found a nice analogy, I thought, for what fat crystals look like. So do y'all see my pencils that I have here? I know if you're in the back, I'm gonna show them to you. You can't see them very well, but they're just a bunch of loose pencils. And if I were to drop these on the table, I can push them all around, and they don't have any real shape. They're very crumbly. Uh, you know, they move very easily. And so this represents what a, um, a, number, a type one crystal in chocolate looks like. It's very crumbly and it doesn't stick together very well. But as we get up into stage five and six, stage five is actually the perfect temperature for, uh, for um, the fat itself because it causes, instead of this mismatch of crystals here, it makes all the crystals become in alignment and they get really tight and they lay close together. Do you see the pencils up on the screen? And then what this does is when you have this type of crystal, when you snap it, it breaks and it all stays together just like this. That's one of the reasons if you have a really good chocolate bar and you snap it and it makes that nice sound, that's what you're looking for for a good quality chocolate. So I thought that was kind of a neat analogy on that I wanted to show y'all. So, and you can see, the one thing I also want to mention is bloom. Have you ever had your chocolate bloom? Yeah, maybe, no. This is bloom. Actually, this is the crystal, but it looks just like it. And this is what happens when you go to, you think, well, if, if five is good, then six must be the best. But you know it really isn't, because what happens is that the chocolate actually comes to the surface rather than staying emulsified. Emulsified is a big science word, and it means all your ingredients and all the chemicals are going to stay together instead of separating out. And if you go to level six, you get this bloom on your chocolate, and it looks like the fat crystals, which is exactly what it is, has come to the surface of your chocolate, and it actually may not be as tasty. It's fine to eat. It won't hurt you but it, you might have lost some of the flavor since the fat is no longer emulsified within the rest of the chocolate. And one other molecular component on this, I thought this was a nice graphic, talking about how all the crystals are, they're all there together. So when you temper something, and you know I mentioned earlier about heating it up and then allowing it to cool, heating it back up and allowing it to cool, 
every time you do that, you make that area between the degrees of the temperature a little smaller, so you get... I know, I actually, so sorry. So, uh, anyway, back to the temperature, critical moment here on my flow. Uh, so you ended up with all these different particles uh, in the molecular structure. So this I thought was an interesting, uh, the goal you see when you first start, you have all these different types of, uh, of crystals, and then the goal is to get it to a level five where just like the pencils, it all stacks together. Now, on to the rest of the chocolates. So we're talking about some, we're getting ready to taste some of the different chocolates. The dark chocolate, as you see up here, has the cocoa mass, cocoa butter, and sugar in it. The milk chocolate, which we're gonna have uh, after that, is got cocoa, the cocoa mass again. It has cocoa butter, sugar, and milk powder. Excuse me. So it's got, it does have a milk component to it. And then the third thing with the cocoa butter, cocoa butter, sugar, and milk powder is usually included in the white, in what we call white chocolate. And I wanna share, it was very interesting to me, the fact that because I actually am of, of, of an age where white chocolate was a faux pas because you didn't even say white chocolate was chocolate because it had no chocolate solid in it. It only has cocoa butter and sugar. But in 2002, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, actually decided, you know what? White chocolate's gotten a bum rap. You know, that we actually know it, it's made of cocoa butter. That's a significant part of the cocoa bean. We're gonna go ahead and say, you can call it white chocolate now. So that's why it's actually being brought into the, the, um, the being officially called chocolate now. So that's how all that kind of came about. So chocolate chemistry. I want to just point out, I don't know how many of y'all, how many of y'all uh, organic chemistry in, uh, that you happen to m make your way through? Any, a few of us out here? Mm. I struggled with my organic, but I gotta say, I learned a lot from it, and I will say chocolate chemistry is amazing. Do you know that you can go online and look for chocolate chemistry, and there are blogs, there is research galore. And I'm not even gonna to touch on the health aspects because I feel like every time I find something, somebody else is doing other research and things are changing so rapidly. Uh, we do know that chocolate, uh, can it be a, a, a help your blood pressure? Uh, I think that's been pretty much verified. But I wanna talk about some of the specific chemistry, sorry, some of the specific chemicals that we can find in chocolate. So if you look up here, and I know this is kind of tiny, but the one on the top here for uh, the uh, dark chocolate, theobromine, which is one of the things we mentioned earlier. Theo means God, and bromine is a type of food. So food of the gods is where that came from. Theobromine is very similar to, not identical to, but similar to caffeine. And it's one of those things that really, when you eat chocolate, it actually can help you focus. Chocolate is actually considered psychoactive. That means there are chemicals in it that do affect our moods. And we know this, this has been scientifically proven. Uh, another, uh, this is called PEA, and it's a phenylethylamine. That's why they call it PEA. Um, so it's another thing that actually is a wonderful mood and it makes you very happy, kind of makes you a little chill, makes you feel good about things. Uh, and the milk chocolate here, one of the things that they pulled out is vanillin and it's a flavor. And I know a lot of us have probably enjoyed vanilla in different things. And so this is another chemical. Did I mention that chocolate has at least 380 different chemicals in it? 380, and we're looking at six here, you know? Uh, butyric acid is another uh, uh, chocolate that's a natural preservative. Sailors would keep their um, chocolate bars for a super, super long time. It does not, takes a lot to make chocolate go rancid because it's very stable. And this is one of the reasons why it's so stable. Um, I'm gonna come back to the, the white chocolate in just a minute, but I just wanted to point out some of the crystals. And then another uh, chemical I wanted to look at, uh, how many of y'all have heard that chocolate, even though it's great for humans, it is not good for dogs and cats? Have y'all heard that? That's a message we wanna put out there. The reason is, it's not just the caffeine, but it's the theobromine especially. 
uh, because dogs and cats cannot process caffeine and theobromine as well as we can. And when, we, when you have too much caffeine, tell me what happens. Get jittery, heart races, does it affect your sleep? Yes, it does me, I know. Now, here's an interesting thing that theobromine actually helps us to sleep. It's a very complex matter that I won't go into right now. It's fascinating. But dogs and cats cannot process. If we have a piece of chocolate or a cup of coffee first thing in the morning, usually by lunchtime, those six hours is a half-life of caffeine for most of us. With an animal, with dogs and cats, when they eat a piece, it lasts way too long in their body. They can't get rid of it. It doesn't go away. And that's why it damages their kidneys and their livers, and it's so bad for them. And so it's just something to be aware of. You, you know, as much as we enjoy it, especially here on Valentine's Day, we love our furry friends and family, and we don't want to have anything happen to them. So, and they love it because it's sweet. I mean, how many of your dogs have a sweet tooth? You know, I know you have to watch them. Oh. You have to watch them a lot. So just a note to self on the chemistry of chocolate as we move forward that there's a lot of, um, of opportunity here and we want to be cautious to our dogs. And uh, the other aspect of that is chocolate and aphrodisiac. That means can chocolate make you fall in love? Well, you think so? Yes. She had a very affirm yes. Well, you know what? If you gift someone with chocolate and they love it, then they just might fall in love with you. So we'll just leave it at that. The other thing I want to mention, and I love this chart because it has one of my favorite uh, beverages at the bottom. I'm a real Mountain, Mountain Dew fiend. So. But just check this out. We talk about um, chocolate having caffeine, and it does. You can look at the top there on the serving side for one ounce. That's the end of your thumb. One ounce of chocolate has about um, 23 milligrams of caffeine and 376 milligrams of theobromine. Now go down and look at the um, coffee, Starbucks. Do you see it at the bottom there? Eight ounces has no theobromine, but it does have 156 grams of caffeine. So a much bigger kick in the caffeine department when you get to coffees and teas. So I just thought this was an interesting comparison with, uh, with um, caffeine and the theobromine. All right, so it's time to taste some more chocolate. So the next one up, we are going to taste the dark chocolate morsels. This has 67% of cacao in it. 67%, so that means the balance, that means the balance of it is the cocoa butter and sugar. And I am using tonight, this is not a plug for uh, this particular product, but it is, um, just to let you know, I'm using Nestle Toll House, and it, it's made with three ingredients, only three ingredients. Those are the only three ingredients in this. So just to let you know if you're curious. Gosh, I wish I thought about this. I actually thought about putting my hair up today and didn't do it. All right. Everybody, go ahead. You should have about five different morsels. I would suggest going ahead and eating all five at the same time so you get a really good mouthful of chocolate. So go ahead, let's eat our, uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to compare our 67% chocolate with our next serving. Everybody had a chance? Yes, hand up. Can I ask a question real quick? Sure. Is dark chocolate better for you than other chocolates? If so, why? Yes. So the question was, is dark chocolate better for you, and if so, why? Uh, the why is pretty straightforward in that it doesn't have any other additives in it. It's more of chocolate, and that's what you're going to note between going from your, your dark chocolate to bittersweet to milk chocolate. 
you tend to have more additives as you go into it. So that aspect is one of the reasons why it's healthier for you. Uh, it also has more antioxidants. It's why it's so dark. It has more flavonoids. If you've heard of the flavonoids, those are things that help us keep our heart and our blood vessels open. So there's a lot of different, because you've got more of it, more content of it, that's one of the reasons why it's better for you. Thank you. Good question. All right, if everybody had a nice mouthful on that, remember that mouth feel, that's how did that feel on your tongue? What was the flavor? Let's go ahead and go with the next chocolate, please. No, the next chocolate is our um, semi-sweet morsel. That one is at our, I think it was 50, let's see, what does it say? All right, this is 53% cocoa. 53%. The one you just had was 67. So see if you can taste a difference in the 67% cocoa that you just ate to the 53. Let's see how many super tasters we have out there. Oh, I'm hearing a lot more affirmation. Is this tasting a little more familiar to what we tend to think of as chocolate? Yes, a resounding yes. So again, this chocolate is nothing but 100% chocolate, cocoa butter, and cane sugar. And I need to mention that. Uh, sugar is certainly something that um, we've heard a lot of. You know, we, one of the things that we're learning is that sugar actually can perhaps cause inflammation in our bodies. Um, and so you want to be careful about the, how much sugar you consume. But there's also been a lot of studies about the negative effects of artificial sugars. And so, you know, we're looking at different things and, and a lot of study uh, in science about those chemical compounds that make up the artificial sugar as well. So I think the storyline right now, it's really better just to consume sugar and just not eat very much of it if you can control yourself like that. And then that's the way to go. But there are other things that you can, when you make chocolate at home, you can use, uh, for a sweetener, you can use honey. A lot of people use chocolate, cocoa butter, and honey. Uh, you can use different types of, um, the ancient Mayans used cornmeal in their chocolate, for their hot chocolate to make it thicker. There are other things, thickening agents, besides uh, we hear a lot about lecithin, which is totally legitimate. It's a soy derivative. That's one of the things that we're gonna eat next in our, um, well, in our white morsels and in our milk chocolate too. So we're gonna go ahead and bring out the white morsels. And uh, just remember that sugar has a lot to do with the flavors of your chocolate as well, as, and also the um, fruits. You might, uh, you know, when you have extracts and different phenols, that's another good chemistry word that we combine to make different recipes for chocolate. All righty, so we've got our white morsels coming up. Remember, poor white chocolate had such a bad rap that not until 2002 was it officially named a chocolate. So now you're getting ready to eat cocoa butter with pure cane sugar. And this does have a few additives in it. Uh, let me find the package on that one. Does anybody here have issues with rice flour? Because that's what they have in this. It's a little bit of rice flour for thickening. Okay.
so as you're having your conversations at your table, did you have an opportunity to decide, did you, were you able to rank them as according to how sweet it was? Could you tell a difference between the dark and the semi-sweet, as far as one being soft, sweeter than the other? And then, wow, what about when you ate the white chocolate? Was that way sweeter? Yes, because you were missing the chocolate solid in that. It was just the cocoa butter and the sugar, so there was more sugar in that. So, All right, any questions right now about the chocolate before we move on to our final test tasting tonight? I know we wish it could go on forever, right? Yes, question down here. Yes. Yeah, in here, yes. This is a pod, and if I slice this open, there would be beans inside of it. As a matter of fact, you can... Do you hear the beans rattling around in there? They've dried out and they're in there. Okay, nice segue is I've got my cacao pod here and we've just talked about the cocoa solids. And let's go ahead and let's distribute our milk chocolate here. Milk chocolate is something that came along later, uh, probably about the early 1800s was one of the first chocolate bars. And so it's very intriguing how history comes into play. Uh, you know, World War I, uh, actually, uh, I know we're excited, the milk chocolate's coming around. This is gonna look familiar. Everybody gets two. This is gonna look familiar. So everybody got their milk chocolate, got your kisses on Valentine's Day. So milk chocolate, we've already learned what was the major component that's been added to this chocolate. Milk. What kind of milk? Powdered. Had to have the moisture removed. You can imagine if you tried to put liquid into what we've been eating tonight, number one, it'd be very difficult to get it to blend back together because of all the fats from the butter from the cocoa butter, but the powder, what happened when you mixed your cocoa powder into that butter? It mixed pretty easily, didn't it? So again, we get the powdered milk and mix the powder into it, and then that works pretty well uh, as you develop your recipes for the different types of, of milk chocolate that you might have. So we have, it is just 7.55. I've got a little bit of time. I'm more than happy to take some questions. And if I don't know the answer, you know, we can always go to the, to the Oracle of Google and find it out. It's a wonderful creation. So who has a question for me? Yes, out here in the middle. Is there anything done with the part of the cocoa? I'm so sorry, the what? The fruit of the cacao. Yes. Well, what happens in the fermentation aspect is gradually the yeast and the fungus really eat the fruit and it's called the baba and it eats that down and, and that's what happens in the fermentation process that fleshy part is just dissolved into that alcoholic the the um, cocoa wine it's literally dissolved into cocoa wine and so then it's left with the nib that you were eating that's what's left behind when the fruit is dissolved and eaten away in the process other questions? I got one here. Oh, I think that would be, to, the, the question was how many flavors of chocolate are there? Uh, remember we talked there's four major types of beans, but when you talk about the flavors, that is very, very hard to pin down. Uh, a lot of people even fight over where the first cocoa bean actually began. 
it, what archaeologists will tell us is that we think it was probably in Mesoamerica, that Central America area was probably first, but there's a lot of contention over that because there are other places that say, oh no, we had it first. We had the first cacao tree. So it's very interesting, um, back to your question about, I think it would be unlimited. You can create how many recipes maybe already that maybe not, that aren't out there. And remember, it's not just sweet. In America, we love our sugar, but there are many countries where they put hot chilies, hot chili peppers with their chocolate. Now I know Jason Woodside's nodding in the back, uh, but they like that hot spice with that chocolate as well. So there's a lot of different things you can do, a lot of ways you can combine your chocolate um, to make different recipes. Question over here? Yes. Uh, the question was, is there any correlation between uh, uh, eating chocolate and your brain function? And they actually have, there's several different studies out there right now that show uh, actually eating a little bit of chocolate while you're studying actually uh, helps you retain what you're studying. That theobromine is actually exactly, it helps you focus. And so, yes, there's a lot of research out there on that. This young man here, do you have a question? you'd have an awful lot. The question was, what would happen if you mixed the bean and the fruit and the cocoa powder? So you would have a lot of chocolate all together there. It would be very wet and gooey. Very wet and gooey. All right, a question right here. Um, what was the first bean ever discovered? Um, like, what was the first bean ever on the earth? Oh, my. <laughs> that is above my pay grade. I do not know the answer. The question was, what was the very first bean on earth? I don't know that one. I don't. I doubt Google knows that either. Yes, next to you. That is an excellent question. We know it does because we felt it ourselves, right? And it has something to do with the crystalline structure, and it's a pretty complicated, a little hard for me to go in to explain, but I can just share with you that different types of chemical compounds melt at different temperatures depending on what they're made of. And it just so happens cocoa butter is very much in line with our body temperature. Might be one of the reasons why we like it so much and why some of us tend to actually feel as though we might get a little addicted to it because we like it so much. So, um, but this has to do again with the crystalline structure. Yeah. Okay, question at the back. I will, I, I can't speak to all companies, but what I would suggest is anytime you buy anything, whether it's coffee, um, anything that's in, in that narrow band of population of agriculture, you will find uh, uh, different uh, USDA labels on it. And it are, there are different companies out there, well, I don't know if companies the right, representatives that are actually working hard to be sure that uh, the trade value, that people are being treated fairly in good conditions and that they're actually receiving uh, an appropriate compensation for their work. So, yeah, I, there's no one in particular I could recommend to you, just off the top of my head. Sorry, yeah. Uh, one, one very good uh, fair trade company is Equal Exchange. Equal Exchange. Thank you very much. Was that thank you to Mr. Google there? Were you looking that up? Well, I, I remember it from our 10,000 villages. Ten, I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with 10,000 Villages. It's a, uh, frequented through our various churches, but we also, um, through that, can, uh, you can buy a heifer, you can do different things for different villages, and exactly right. I had forgotten about them. Thank you, Ted. All right, one more question to wrap up the evening. Yes, right here.
From what I have read, you can. It does not have the nutritive value at that point that it does after it's been fermented, but you can eat it. It is, it, and uh, actually, the uh, monkeys love it, and they eat it all the time bef and without it being fermented. But uh, yes, it can be eaten. The question was, can you eat the fruit without it being fermented? And the answer is yes, you can. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been so much fun, and I can promise you, oh, thank you. That's great, I'll take it. I, I hope that just being able to taste a few of these uh, uh, chocolate products just back to back to back to back, because I know you, you're in the store and you think about it and you go, I just never have done that, you know? So I hope that was a fun experience for you. I promise you, if you go online, you can find chocolate chemistry, chocolate physics. It is amazing what's out there. So thank you so much, and I hope this encouraged you to do a little bit more study on your own. Thanks so much.